Okay, so this session is going to be about the role of bio-inspired modularity in general learning. My name is Rachel St. Clair, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues who helped with this paper, Dr. William Hahn and Dr. Elon Barinholtz. So today we're going to discuss how modularity, which is taken from biological neural networks, can be applied to computational neural networks in order to afford broad feature learning, which may give rise to general learning by preserving knowledge over the course of a model's lifelong learning process. So the current approaches in artificial intelligence are to use deep neural networks, which rely on a process called backpropagation to learn how to update the weights. So in these networks, basically what you're doing is you have a, a collection of numbers which describes the information that the network is learning from the current inputs or, or what we call weights. And these weights get modified based on the error signal or some sort of optimization signal um, from the gradient. And so it happens in backpropagation. And um, by the way, most deep neural networks or, or most current AI approaches can be categorized as this sort of gradient optimization approach. And uh, especially like reinforcement learning, that's just a optimization of reward function, right? So when we're talking about optimizing these gradients, what we're talking about is that the input that you're giving to the system is going to create some theoretical gradient, which is partially calculated in order to modify the current learning for the sake of the current inputs. So anytime that we change the inputs or we change the task, what's gonna end up happening is that gradient is also going to change. And so when you change the gradient, you're going to have to rewrite or overwrite information that has previously been learned at a different point in the input process. So this, entire process of backpropagation is inherently going to encode uh, narrow features. So we're going to learn features which allow us to optimize this gradient, and it's nearly impossible to get an input space large enough to capture all of the uh, things that could happen, all of the different circumstances that could happen in the natural world. And even if we could, this would be ex uh, very extensive in the amount of resources that we would need in order to compute uh, this large, vast amount of um, inputs to expand the gradient. And that's what we've been seeing in the explosion of big data networks like GPT-3 and, uh, and CLIP and, and other neural networks like that. So it's kind of clear here that the brain is not suffering from catastrophic forgetting. There is this memory issue, and yes, that's separate. But in general, what we're trying to say is that the brain has somehow figured out how to encode new information without detrimentally rewriting or overriding what it's already learned. When we learn to ride a bike and then we learn to drive a car, we don't suddenly forget how to ride a bike. So the problem is that catastrophic forgetting in deep neural networks is due to the nature of backpropagation itself. And that if we want to update our current networks, we often do this at the expense of prior learning. And so this by default is not going to be a good method for general intelligence. So how is the brain solved this, right? How, how come the brain isn't doing this backpropagation method? And there's a lot of papers out there on whether or not brain is actually doing backpropagation. But what's important here is to try to figure out how the brain might have figured out some general feature encoding separate of the learning algorithm that's being used. So the previous approaches to mitigating catastrophic forgetting is, sorry, the previous approaches to mitigating catastrophic forgetting is largely between weight preservation and bootstrapping. So in weight preservation, what we're going to do is we're gonna strategically uh, preserve weights. And this process just temporarily dislocates weights that have been learned in a different part of the training task, and then either freezes them or reinserts them for later learning so that the information that's being encoded is distributed throughout the model's lifetime. And the problem with this is as the model ages, as lifelong learning occurs, you're going to see more and more resource constraints that actually what's going to happen is you're going to reach some resource asymptote 
where you're not able to encode new information without overriding something that has previously been learned. There's only so much strategic preservation that you can do. And likewise, for the case of bootstrapping, the current methods largely center around resampling data and transfer learning, which have been great approaches uh, to helping deep neural networks learn faster and be a bit more robust. But the problem here is that expanding the gradient doesn't necessarily correspond to general feature learning. So it may appear that the network that has been transfer learned or the network that has done this resampling technique is happening to um, it's, it's happening to look like it's doing more, but in fact, this is just an expansion of more narrow feature learning and often requires more resources or training time. And in fact, what we're not seeing is a demonstration in general feature encoding. And drawing from biology, one way in which we think the brain is doing this that's not resampler, resampling or transfer learning is through indirect activation. So if you see this diagram down here, uh, this is taken from the paper Resource Implications for a Conscious Machine by Andrew Coward and uh, Dr. Thomas Gedeon. And uh, basically what they're saying in this diagram is that our columns in cortical uh, nervous tissue are able to self-activate based on some other mechanisms in order to provide contextual information and novel circumstances. And this isn't currently seen in the computational approaches that we're using today. So what do we know about the brain and how it might be overcoming uh, this catastrophic forgetting problem, right? What we see is that evolutionary has evolution has highly conserved modularity in almost all vertebrate brains. So all mammals, all birds, reptiles, sharks and some fish have the basic four different sections of brain regions right and so what we see is that these spatially and functionally distinct regions play a role in the ability to learn and adapt for these organisms and the best example of that is in the human brain where we see the subcort subcortical regions and the cort cortical regions play a big role in general feature learning so to be more specific some neuroscientists think that the cortex is in fact encoding general patterns that are later interpreted by the basal ganglia for behavioral selection. And it's imperative for our brains and, and other mammalian brains to have this architecture in order to do the type of learning that we do. So here, we think that modularity multiplexes information. And it does this in a way by separating types of computation. So we can also call this specialization. And this type of specialization refers to different functions of the brain. So you may have modules that correspond to memory or to sensory processing, like the cortex, or to resource, resource management, like the hippocampus, and so forth. Another thing we see in modular uh, bioarchitectures is storing learning across partially updatable boundaries, which we can call segregation. So this is basically the exact morphology or uh, separation physically of neural tissue. And this is particularly important for uh, not allowing certain neurons, which are doing a certain type of computation to uh, connect with other neurons around it, right? If you, if you make um, a, a big distinction between this neural tissue, the information can't cross that boundary. And uh, this helps in the learning process. So of course, between these regions, we can have a transfer of information, which we can refer to as integration. And here I think integration is particularly interesting because we're talking about a module who is synthesizing its information in order to send to the global state of the brain or the network in general. So we can think of this synth synthesizing as sort of a compression, not lossless compression or, or binary compression in computer terms, but some sort of reduction of the information without losing the contents of the information, which gives us some sort of resource, resource conservation, which is really helpful for practical applications and artificial systems. So these three components, specialization, segregation, and in integration, help the modular networks uh, provide different learning algorithms, right? So the cortex is doing one type of learning update where it's changing the synapses based off one type of information flow. 
And the basal ganglia is doing another type of, at least it's thought to be doing a different type of learning update through consequence feedback or more widely known it, um, from psychology as reinforcement learning. So separating into modules allows us to have this resilience and compression properties. And that if one module is slightly damaged, as long as it's not a critical module to the organism survival, that brain or that architecture can most likely recover. And so this resilience would suggest that the information has been distributed throughout the system enough that when a couple of neurons die or, or some, some extravagant night out or something like that, humans aren't, aren't in despair for losing a couple of neurons. This, this highly suggests that information is, is largely distributed, even with modularity. And I, we think that modularity plays a role in multiplexing this information, right? Um, which is not seen in deep neural networks. And again, compression by synthesizing information in one module and sending it to the other, we've somehow figured a way to mix together all the information into one packet in order to send without requiring exponential resources. So I think a big question that we should be asking at this point is what types of inductive biases do different modular architectures afford, right? So why has evolution so highly preserved these different types of modular architectures throughout the 540 mil million years of evolution that we've seen so far? I think that's a really great question to be looking at in terms of how to design artificial systems. So the previous approaches for um, kind of how would you design an artificial neural network are mostly centered around optimizing those networks for the particular task that's at hand. And instead, what we would like to see, and this is pretty much a call to action, what we would like to see is some of those approaches maybe reevaluating the uh, either fitness function or the goal of how we construct those architectures to be more geared towards how do we design architectures that mitigate catastrophic forgetting or that provide bootstrapping mechanisms. And this leads us to talk about implementation approaches. So, when we're talking about modularity, really what we're talking about is how do we design the genetics in the um, developmental processes to construct the initial topology before we even turn that brain on, right? So a lot of stuff happens to design your brain architecture before you come out of your mother's womb, right? And so we need to be doing the same thing in our computational approaches to saying, hey, let's spend a lot of time figuring out the best initial topology for the particular type of learning we want to do. And in the case of general learning, we think that modularity can, can play a big role in, in uh, learning general features, right? So it should be clear that there's this trade-off between initial topology and later weight modification or, or what we call later learning. Right. However you structure your architecture in the beginning is going to preclude or it's going to it's going to change your availability to update different neural components later on in the organisms or the modules lifelong learning process. And when we look up here on this right side over here, this is just one example of how you might introduce a computational modular system um, in sort of a, a neural network style fashion. So I'm not saying let's drop back propagation. I'm just saying maybe let's start to consider how modularity might play a role in back propagating systems or in other learning algorithm systems. So here we have different neural networks in these boxes, which are going to take in uh, multimodal sensory streams. So these networks maybe perhaps communicate, they, they integrate and communicate to some memory center, some hippocampus-like center, which can then indirectly activate in those networks, uh, depending on the novel context that the organism is experiencing. And perhaps there's some resource managing center, which is going to take all this information into account, much like the hippocampus does, um, to say, hey, we need more cortical synapses here, or do synaptic pruning here, much like we see in our biological counterparts. So this is one simple example of how you could draw inspiration from biology to design modular architectures. And of course, this search space 
of just choosing intelligently designed architectures and pairing them with computational tasks task is very, very large. Even if you did it at random by generating random topologies and then pairing with some, some sort of task or sequence of tasks, it's still going to be a very large search space. And of course, any work done in this space will be helpful. But I think a better approach, and this is what my dissertation and future work is, is focusing on, is how might we simulate the evolutionary process that led to this highly conserved modularity? So, um, so if we take the evolutionary optimization approach, we have to consider that um, we want to design a fitness function that's based on the preservation of knowledge, right? We want to be able to learn new things without overriding old things, which is what this talk's all about. So knowledge preservation is a particular term I'm using, which is kind of the inverse of catastrophic forgetting. And I think it's better to think about uh, the entire problem of backpropagation under the framework of knowledge preservation, because we're no longer limited by the effects of backpropagation. Instead, what we're looking for is an algorithm which can do two things. First of all, we want to be able to learn new tasks without overriding prior information. And by doing that, the model can return to previously learned tasks without relearning, right? So, Back to our example, if we teach the model how to ride a bike and then how to drive a car, it still knows how to ride a bike. And right now, if you took Siri, who can understand natural language processing, and you taught her to trade stocks on the market, which LSTMs can do both of these tasks, the LSTM or Siri would no longer be able to go back and understand natural language which is not at all like how a human brain functions. So the second thing we wanna be able to do with knowledge preservation algorithms is store information for later bootstrapping. So a model that can store information without requiring exponential resources is going to be able to synthesize information in a way that is maximally general for later bootstrapping and in novel context. So this goes back to our, our previous uh, pictures of indirect activation and cortical common, uh, columns, just for a biological example. So since we're talking about building, building algorithms or building modules with these type of learning algorithms, we need to be able to benchmark them. So um, I'm proposing here that the best way to benchmark these algorithms is to test our networks on sequences of tasks. So when it comes to learning without overwriting, we want to be able to learn task A and then learn task B and then return to task A with minimal loss in performance. That would show us that we haven't overwritten everything in task A. And I, I would also like to suggest that if we could demonstrate this across different data domains, so say in computer vision and then in time series, that might help us in understanding whether or not there are high level general features that are encoded in this sort of very resource conscious uh, manner. And uh, so the other thing we want to be able to benchmark is bootstrapping prior learning. So here we will need some sort of learning algorithm in which says use the information we've stored in this novel context to help you learn it faster or better, right? So what we're looking for here, what we're benchmarking here, is that in a sequence of tasks, after learning a particular task, if I switch to a new task, can I use information from task A in task B? And using information in task A in task B would appear in either an increased speed or performance in task B. So all the same things from learning without overriding apply here for bootstrapping, but we also want to consider dynamic node activation. And so what we're talking about here is that we can peer into the, the neural network or whatever model we're using, and we can look at how information is flowing through this network. And what we're looking for is little submodules that are going to activate for general concepts. So one example of this in biology or in the human brain is the fusiform face area which lights up not only for faces, but also for people that are experts at recognizing birds. So there's something about this whole picture and distinguishing between whole pictures that the fusiform face area is particularly uh, geared towards encoding, right? So we, we would expect to see some sort of similar sub-activation network in our computational models if it is in fact doing this bootstrapping um, prior learning in a general manner. So 
And considering these remarks, we need to first look at um, some considerations. So the first point is more general and just what we all struggle with as scientists in that reductionism and generality don't necessarily go hand in hand. So if you're looking to see if an artificial system is hyper adaptable or that it's able to generalize to many circumstances, you're always going to have to wonder if your experiments are giving you results on generality or if the results you're seeing just happen to be a byproduct by chance or, or some intelligent design here of the environment itself. We can't possibly test the entire natural space, um, at least in training and, and writing up reports as, as good scientists. So we just have to be mindful to try to engineer our, our experiments to escape this reductionism and that sometimes the parts don't always add up to the whole, right? And that our experiments may not always add up to the causality that we'd like to describe. And of course, we already mentioned that the search space of possible topology and task is um, exponential, right? It's, it's astronomical, really. And that the different types of networks you could possibly design is, is almost endless. And every time you add a node to the network, you're only increasing the number of ways in which that node can be con connected to the existing nodes. And when we're designing these networks, we really need to take into consideration that modularity will not be half as powerful if we're not designing it with the later learning algorithms in mind. Um, a good example of how you might stumble in this approach is that if you're designing a neural network that or some module that is going to be exceptionally good at bootstrapping contextual information, so you design the modularity or the topology to be geared towards this bootstrapping, but you don't provide any algorithm to actually self-activate this stored information. Uh, the modularity is only going to be so beneficial. So we need to really have a systems engineering approach when thinking about modularity or about initial topology and how it relates to downstream general feature encoding. So I think in summary, what we can say uh, so far is that modularity may allow us to preserve knowledge by multiplexing information under resource constraints. And that if we want general intelligence, an initial stepping stone to that process is looking at how we can learn new things without overriding prior learning and how we can store that information of learning in a way that we can bootstrap to adapt to novel circumstances. So thank you for your time, and I hope this was a fun thought experiment. I'd be happy to talk about any questions or any directions, um, either in the panel or otherwise.